ever imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total protonic reversal. Protonic reversal. Protonic reversal with your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with sharp and nails. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. <laughs> That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed it is. It is a science thing, it's a science place, it's a scientific fact that we're all up in your face. It's time once again for the one, the only, Protonic Reversal. Welcome to it, welcome to it, welcome to it. Tonight's special episode, episode 301, uh, Stefan Edgerton of the Descendants all a little band a little outfit called flag perhaps you've heard of that uh yeah uh, legend iconic guitar player and fellow i'm really interested in uh talking to so this would be a good episode uh thanks everyone for the kudos for episode 301 that was a weird flex to do it that way but uh the answering questions things actually worked pretty well and uh, i feel like that was an okay time for everybody. So, I am your host, Kona Neutron. I am a rock and roll lifer who has toured and recorded for over 22 years. Most known for the band Kona Neutron and the Secret Friends. Music is a huge part of my life, and I use the format of this very long-running podcast to talk about music with musicians whose work I enjoy and who I respect. Folks that may or may not be household names, but do something very, very special. This is episode 301. 301, people. And uh, thank you very much for tuning in for it. As a reminder, if this is your first time listening to the show, all the archives are at protonconversal.com and are always free. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding. If you'd like to support the show and get episodes sooner, you can do so by giving $1 a month at patreon.com slash protonconversal. And if you like the show or even just a single episode, please feel free to like, subscribe, uh, post a review, any of those kinds of things. Uh, it all helps out the show, and it's just a darn nice thing to do. So, uh, Stefan Edgerton. Yeah, this is going to be great, man. I'm looking forward to talking to this guy. This is uh, one of my favorite guitar players, iconic dude. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a good time. So let's maybe potentially get right down to it. Uh, Stefan, thanks so much, man. Thanks so much for doing this. Welcome to the show. Uh, it's thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is a momentous uh, occasion because I've been trying to trying to get you on this show for a while, uh, and uh, yes. you finally agreed to it. And I my appreciate life, that. Uh, well, it's more like my life just gets busy and funny, and then I forget. Oh shoot, I was supposed to do this thing. And, <laughs> exactly. It's been a bit. It's been a hectic few months. Let's put it that way. So absolutely. So, yeah. but glad to be here. Glad we could finally make it come together. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I think that there's you, you got your mouth a lot going on. Uh, you're, you're correct me if I'm wrong. You're uh, Tulsa is, is where where you're I'm based, in Tulsa. Out, right? Yeah, I live in Tulsa. That's where yeah. you have your your studio and stuff like and that. Where do you live? I, I live in, Mil- in I live in Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, Milwaukee. So I'm Milwaukee. from Oakland, California, but I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But you live in Milwaukee, where Dan Kubinski's from. Dan Kubinski and Keith Brammer, my very good friend. Yes, uh, all, all, excellent. All the Decroitsons. Uh Yes, I love them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that. So let's start things off. Uh, with I appreciate that when when I saw that you had that um I guess it's a signature music man, right? That that it was uh no knobs, nothing to no no <laughs> no toggles to knock into accidentally. Like it's just it's it's straight in. and that is that is absolutely a man after my own heart for that. 
I, I appreciate well, it, it. It arrived that way by, by, um, you know, practicality because I, uh, you know, I didn't use the knobs anyway. And then I would right. be on, you know, they would have, eventually they would rust from sweat getting into them. And, and at some point I was having a problem getting signal out of my guitar. So I just said, ah, screw these things. And I yanked them out and just wired straight to the jack. And then I kind of just got used to it being like that. And I don't, um, I don't, I'm not a graceful guitarist. So I, I would, uh, at least like my right arm, you know, is just kind of all over the place. And it kept me from just slamming my fingers into the, into the knobs all the time and turning them up or down or whatever. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Just having a big fat, nothing works great. For me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks beautiful and it sounds great. And, and, you know, it looks that's... cool. Yeah, it looks good. It looks, you know, it, it's, it just kind of works on every level for me. I like it. And I think that, uh, you know, you're one of those guitar players that, for me anyway, that I can imme- I immediately know it's you. Like when I hear it, I'm like, oh, I know who that is. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Thank good. you. That's awesome. That's, <laughs> that's good. We hope for that in the world, but you know, we, um, uh, that, that thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, let's let's keep it. You know, talking about music. From my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you you kind of before you came to punk rock, you had you had something of a musical family. Like you had a um, records around the house, people playing. Right? Is that my very much so? Yes. Yes. My mother, my my mom used to sing to me in the crib, play guitar. Oh. Um, so there was a guitar ever present in, in my house, and. Um, so she taught me my first chords. We had a, a pretty badass record collection, I have to say. My, my, my mom had good taste in music for times. And uh, so there was a, a, an, an interesting variety of music. And uh, yeah, so I, I, uh, I started playing at nine. Um, she taught me my first chords, taught me how to pick things off of records. And sort of, though she's not a super uh, formally trained musician. She did. She does know how to read music. She can play violin. She she was a singer in a band at one time. So, um, but she definitely knew how to help me connect the dots. Uh, you know, for for developing my ear enough to be able to tell what was going on on records. So it you know helped me start to pick things off records and stuff. So yeah, she she sort of got me started. No question. And then when was the first time? When's the first time you heard a record where you're like, oh, this is this is different. Like this hits different. Like, was it uh, early on? Early on. So, I mean, the first the first record that I know that I that I became a big fan of was the soundtrack to Hair. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, but I mean, I was really young. (laughs) Yeah, 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 sure. But but this was a record that I asked for over and over again. So, I mean, all kids, I think, you know, who who attach to music, which most do in some way, they. you know, that was a record that I was like, play that one, play that one over and over right. again. And I was, you know, three or something. I was really into that. But the, you know, the, the music that captured me really and made me want to pursue it with, you know, with little yes, interest no. in anything else is definitely the Beatles. No question. <laughs> you know, they're my, they're still my gold standard for pretty much everything. Playing, songwriting, you name it. <laughs> Co- common, common story. Two things. Did you see, did you, did you watch, watch Get Back? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think everyone, um, and, <laughs> everyone who plays in a band. Well, did, it's just so you know, it's so fascinating to see that. And and you know, if you're a person who's been in a band, it's funny. There there are a lot of there are so many things that you see that you know that are kind of things that all bands kind of have yes. go through and, and <laughs> personality types that sort of come together in certain ways. You go, yeah, you know, this person, you know. These are, this or that person might sort of represent, you know, what these guys are doing. But, you know, it, it's fairly, uh, it's, you know, fairly standard. They were just all, you know, so excellent. So that, that was a great thing. Absolutely. You know? And they liked each other. I mean, I know, you know, it was, the, I think the great takeaway from Get Back is just that, you know, there was a, um, uh, I think, you know, because of that original bunch of, um, uh, all of the, um, you know the film footage that had made its way out there was 
you know, sort of suggested that there was a, a lot of negativity between the band. But, yeah. you know, watching it, I was like, I don't think this is any more negative than like any number of bands. That I, know. <laughs> I think this is pretty much I mean, I think it was pretty much standard. You know, there are yeah. there are flare ups, you know, it's it's a creative process, that, uh, you know, and, and there's deep passion in it. So it's going to have, you know, bumps in the road here and there. And you kind of learn to work through those. And uh, so to me, it was, you know, it was it all seemed pretty normal. <laughs> so, so to see them, you know, I think they were still friends and having fun. That's the way I looked. When you get to see them, like, uh, you know, they're, they're doing the goof around thing where it's the song, but they're changing the lyrics to be about stuff that's in the room. <laughs> things, and yeah, things like and that every like, band does. Oh, 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 oh. You yeah. know, they're gritting their teeth and singing through them. And, you know, and I, I, I love that, um, that, you know, finally, rather than, you know finally yoko gets like a little bit of a break you know like from people just you know yeah. bagging on her because it's like you know it's what her presence somehow you know i mean she's just sitting there with linda like if, yeah. if there had been if there had been iphones in you know in 1968 or whatever you know they, they would have just been sitting there on their chairs on their iphones just hanging out I mean, it was just you know it's like really this is that big of a deal you know it, it, it's very interesting to see that one of my favorite parts too is when like Paul and John are kind of going at it about some mundane arrangement thing or whatever and disagreeing. And then you just focus back and you just see Ringo just sitting, sitting down, like patiently waiting because I just want to play the drums, you know, <laughs> just I just want to play. yeah, that's, that's yeah, exactly. But you know, and the other thing that the other thing, I mean, you, you know, I, I don't get the impression that Peter Jackson was trying to sort of foist this kind of an image uh, of him, but you see that Ringo is, in fact, kind of the glue in the band, you know, yeah. and and uh, there's usually one of those guys, too, that's yeah. kind of like, you know, the guy who, you know, gets a lot. He gets plenty of respect from everybody. And, uh, you know, and is kind of like the guy who's adaptable, but also like if need be, can kind of talk sense into the people around him who sure. are flying off the handle. And, you know, it's easy to forget that, you know, from where from their perspective, Ringo, you know, he was a well-established musician. He was, you know, above their pay grade at the time that they got him in the band. They were lucky to get him. He was yeah. a local badass. So, you know, in a funny way, that 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 respect remained you know what I mean? Even even through the fact that Paul and John were obviously, the, you know, principal songwriters or whatever. And um, but they still had deep respect for Ringo. And, you know, hence he played with them, all of them at some point or another after they broke up and so on. And so it's kind of cool. Ringo's just kind of the guy like, you know, that, every, you know, he, he's. Kind of just holding the whole ship together, but nobody knows it. Right, right, <laughs> exactly, him. exactly. Yeah, he's, he's like secretly <laughs> keeping keeping it all together. And you know, bands bands are such a delicate chemical uh, reaction that it's so fascinating to be like, oh yeah, it's harder, for, it's easy to forget they were just a band too. Like they were like they the were biggest band. band in the world, but they were just a band. And I always yeah. The, oh, go ahead. Yeah, the circumstances foisted on them were you know were you know obviously sure. exceptional and, yeah. and and bizarre but i mean they were you know uh, it's funny I, you watch all that stuff and you just go well this is very bands right here this is totally what bands are like you know yeah absolutely yeah, well and and um you know another thing i liked about it was the, <laughs> the fact that the beatles had a experience very similar to a lot of punk rock bands that they're like how many songs are they going to get through for the cops shut it down you know there was there was that <laughs> yeah that, that was great that was great but you know again and i always end up coming back to ringo but watch that fucking performance man yeah. ringo is slamming the shit out of the drums he is a total <laughs> badass i mean they all are and it's funny to think that you know oh wow we haven't played a show in a long time and obviously there you know there's some excitement of the new and did not sure. new for them but you know what i mean like uh, newly new i guess it would be but right. um uh but you know ringo man he was just god he's just laying waste on those on the drums and yeah. on that performance it's it's just stunning to watch and and you know a lot of people pointed out if you you know saw commentary online a lot of people would be talking about um you know paul and john's kind of like uh interaction you know momentary interaction while the whole thing is going on and they're, they're obvious you know mutual love respects sure you know um all of that stuff like it's it, it was really it was really awesome and then there's billy preston who's also kind of like saving the day too a little bit and know? they're all in their best behavior as soon as billy preston yeah. shows up. 
<laughs> yeah, like, oh, where's Billy Preston? This guy's an actual real yeah, oh, oh, oh. Tighten up, everybody. All right, let's see. Let's, yeah, let's, uh... get it together. Here's, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So anyway, yeah, for my, for me, the Beatles are still a gold standard. And, sure. and you, you know, I end up talking about them all the time. Uh, but, you know, they really just profoundly affected me. And there's no question that they, they you know, plotted. A, once I, you know, was familiar with that, I never really wanted to do anything except that. You know, that, yeah. and I mean, that's something you hear all the time from an older generation. It would be like, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. It absolutely changed my life and everything. It, it absolutely defined the, my course moving forward. And that's exactly what happened. But just from the records that, that we had in my collection, my mom's collection. I was going to say, it's a, yeah, it's a pretty common refrain. It's sort of like, you know, Beatles on Sullivan. Like that was like, that was it, you know, or <laughs> that's, that's it. That, it changed everything. You know, it changed everything for young people. Right there. It must have been wild to be in that moment because, you know, I was responding to it more just musically without any context for for the the grand social, you know, piece that that it really meant, you know, for for young people and, uh, uh, you know, what would happen following it. Yeah, I mean, it's it changed the world, right? So that's absolutely that's, that's very much thing. Yeah, amazing. You know. So how did you get in? How did you get in starting to play uh, in punk rock? Because the uh, uh, the Descendants, uh, you you have played with Carl previously, right? Like, uh, was it yes. very organic? Did you have like an idea, like I want to start a band that you know sounds like has a sound like this, a guitar sound like this, or did, did you start off more traditionally? Or well, so so punk rock came. You know, I I had been like I said, I've been playing since I was nine. I started playing regularly publicly when I was eleven at a shopping mall down the street from from where I grew up that would allow buskers. You could mm -hmm. go in and kind of do a little, um, you know, a little audition. And so I went in, did an audition and they, you know, gave me a permit so I could go down there and play and make, and, uh, you know, which was awesome. Cause I made my own spending money, uh, starting when I was 11. <laughs> that was badass. Um, already a working musician. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah already, as, as a young guy, uh, you know, I could buy my own McDonald's, you know, uh, but it, it, um, and and you know certainly that that was acoustic guitar and singing though that was more that was where i was at i i you know the the early songs that i learned how to play just the simple basic stuff that i could play um was you know john prine songs you know, there were a couple of beatles songs i could play but you know just just um largely fairly you know chuck berry i, I could play just basic rock and roll songs yeah and sing them you know not extremely well but i could sing them and you know if you're a little kid everyone goes well look at a little kid he's singing and playing guitar that's badass you know <laughs> right yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty pretty cool at the time get a lot of attention lavished on you you know so so um there was that and, um and i was i probably would have continued on with singing and so on but when i heard the uh, the sex pistols um which you know the i i will say i had had my mind opened to greater music um jazz music fusion music uh by by my mom being in in this band with a, a, a couple of a couple of music students from the college that she worked at and i learned uh eventually that that band's guitar player taught me uh, how to you know he taught me scales and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and, and he turned me on to um jeff beck john oh, mclaughlin you know okay. yeah, yeah, proper yeah. guitarists you know Jimi hendrix i mean he was the guy who sort of was like no if you you know and i wanted to be i wanted to play electric dark and the beatles did so sure yeah. um so uh you know i fell into listening to a lot of that and really when when i discovered punk rock the music that i was most into right at that time was was definitely jeff beck john you know the mahavish new orchestra larry coriel and the 11th house i had bought a few jazz records um by then my my mom had remarried and and uh her second her husband had a, a fantastic collection of interesting records there was adventures there was all kinds of interesting stuff in there so um i was really into yes uh early Fleetwood Mac, you know, like before, you know, when they were still, when they're still a blues band. That sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so that's, you know, when I heard the pistols, it upended, you know, all of that. And the, the, that's the, you know, I was like, uh, and that's the music that I think connected with me as a person more than just music. 
more than just you know notes and scales and that kind of stuff it was more like okay this is the the song of my people right right <laughs> or whatever um and so that you know that that's kind of what i got into there was was the pistols and i wanted to um but my voice was wholly unsuited to that music and still is so i i you know my focus became more on guitar it really had from the time that i started you know when my guitar teacher was showing me you know mm -hmm. um, the great guitar players out there um that's when i started um you know focusing more on guitar and then punk rock kind of sealed that deal and so i didn't bother with singing really again past that until more recently but um yeah so that's you know with punk rock that's kind of what happened there i just i think i responded to it it was it, i'm not going to say it was easy to play because it's not easy to play it's, it's a it's an entirely different physicality from right. the music that I had played before then. I, it yeah. was nothing like that, actually. So in that way, it was it was pretty new to me. And, did, did somebody have to um, teach you to palm mute, or did you figure that out? Like, <laughs> like No, I, I stumbled into it. It kind yeah. of made sense. I sort of, you know, I, 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 I kind of knew, I think I had just played enough hours to kind of know what's up, you know, with yeah. that kind of stuff. But, but um you know those tones were really something but you know the, the um and i I've, I've kind of said said this before but i'll sort of repeat it here because it does kind of bear on the whole on on that discussion that you know if you're i was i grew up in salt lake city if you're if you're into punk rock in salt lake city where there's no you know there's no there a local scene did develop but there's not a lot of input from outside there was you know we were just getting records that's all we had yeah. to go was records yeah. and so punk rock to me it was everything from the Sex Pistols and the Stranglers and the Ramones and the Clash and what you know, uh, um, Richard Hell and the Voidoids to the B 52s to Devo to Throbbing Gristle to you know, uh, sure. Gary Newman and Two Boy Army. It you know, it was a it encompassed new wave music, it encompassed you know, stuff that was only done on synthesizers like Suicide. I mean, it was it you know, there was a, a massive breadth of, of stuff that wasn't just guitar rock. Um, and so, you know, that's what punk rock, you know, it was a, it was a, you know, even, even to the, uh, the first, you know, um, specials record, selector record, yeah. the, those all came into me for me under the, you know, under the umbrella of punk rock because that's just what was getting sold at my local store. And it was like, Oh, okay. So I take these things home and listen to them and love them and learn to play from them, you know? Yeah, and, it's, and it seemed like there probably wouldn't be like a like a rule book necessarily for it to be like, oh, this is cool. This sounds oh, that's a crazy sound. Where do they Absolutely. come up with that? <laughs> Absolutely, this is the new shit that's coming out. It's yeah. rad, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What, what I was, that's where I was sitting, you know. So, so for me, there was a fair, you know, there was some surf music in there, yeah. you know. That you know, if you think about the B fifty twos or fuck, even the Dead Kennedys. I mean, East Bay Ray's got you know heavy oh, on, the, on yeah. the like Dwayne Eddy and you know. Uh, secret agent man <laughs> you know what i mean that uh so so all of those what if dick came, dale came but from outer me. space yeah exactly <laughs> dick dale but pissed off from outer space exactly. yeah, yeah. fuck shit up yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but dangerous yeah well and and that's uh you know i think all that comes through like in your plane too because it's it's definitely like like i said earlier that uh, you know i feel like you have a you have a sound that it's it sounds like you like whether it's like a descendants or all or you know whether it's the you, you know, the, the seven degrees record like i heard that it was like is that seven hundred ten i think it is like you just know from the sound which is which is something i think every musician kind of you know hopefully is is, is going for um, yeah you want that to happen if you're you know if you're so lucky i don't ever hear it that way i sure, don't hear of course you know so uh but i certainly you know, I, I like anybody else. What's funny is that I, I know other people do hear me that way. So I'm just stoked when I find that out because I go, yeah. I don't know what it is, but I'm glad it's there. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I think that, uh, you know, there's there's something to be said for that because also, I mean, like, let's it's been so long with the, with the descendants, especially that I think some folks, unless they maybe they're you know, pretty, pretty old school, like a little older than myself, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 45 in, in December, but I would be young compared to some of the people that were, that were around for it. Uh, those are some big shoes to fill in, in, in descendants. Oh yeah. That was the, you know, 
and in the case of yeah, that that's very much true. While Frank wasn't like a a noodley player, or no, player, or Ray, not <laughs> yeah. they they didn't do that at all. They they did bring a certain other uh, kind of a physicality to it that was fairly new to me in a, in, yeah. a, in a way. I mean, I I understood its foundations, but I hadn't spent a lot of time mining that exact thing. My you know, um, so. So in that case, there was definitely um, trying to honor that music because I was a fan of the band, you sure, know, yeah. going back to the Fatty P, you know. So, so for me, it was trying to honor Frank and Ray, and then you know also have a chance to you know put my you know put my mark into it too if I could, and and fortunately that's kind of worked out. And I mean, while it's pretty hard to sound like a, a another guitar player and nail it, you can at least you know, try to appreciate the, what they were going for. And in right. Frank's case, Frank, Frank, um, you know, was, Frank was a good friend and he, he, um, no question that, that that early lineup of the descendants has all of the, um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to, to find there. I, I guess it would be like fanaticism right. of youth that would lead you to go, I'm only doing this this way. This is the right way. Fuck everything else. Like that that kind right. of thing would um you know, so in Frank's case that might be like I refuse to play guitar solos and I'm only playing downstrokes. That kind of like yeah. just absolute like commitment to something even if it, you know, really is kind of a temporary thing. It doesn't mean shit. But it's just that that that's a youth thing. Just like I was about music. Once I discovered punk rock, I couldn't give two fucks about anything except punk rock. You know? <laughs> right, like, exactly, oh, exactly. I listened to that old shit, you know. Um, later on, of course, I amended that. But, but uh, you know, there was a period there where it was like that. And and so to try to get in the headspace of Frank or Ray, what they were, what they were thinking a yeah. little bit too. And so with any luck to bring the songs, you know, to people in a way that feels familiar to them um, and familiar to me. Sure. And I mean, he's, uh, you know, again, you're not the same kind of player, but an iconic player. Like he would be power stanced up and just, you know, like just downstroking like a, like a SOB. Right. And, and that's, uh, you know, God bless him. Like that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's great. That's right. I, and I love Full commitment. I, I love it. <laughs> and I love that in the documentary, you get, you get to see a little bit of that and, and it also get to see that, you know, it's been the same guys for so long, but like there was a lot of, it took a while to get there. And then you just make up oh, now it's going to be when they up. Oh, nope. Uh, now it's going to be, the, nope, nope. All right. Now it's going to be the, and it's, it's almost, I, I like that they showed all of that because I think a lot of times documentaries, especially will only kind of, you know, they'll jump to the fireworks factory too early a little bit, you know? <laughs> right. For sure. For sure. No, those guys nailed that. I mean, they really did. I mean, they honored it, you know, and in every way that they could find to do so. It, yeah. was, it was pretty impressive, really. It was awesome. So when yeah. you, and again, it's a million years ago at this point, right? But like, you know, you know, you know, Carl, you know how he, how he plays, you know how, you know, you are, are friends, you have that sort of like affinity for each other. When you first start playing in, in the sentence, again, taking it way back, right? Like what's the, what's the first thing you think of first chord like first like when you play with those guys like what's the first thing you thought of Well okay so so the the way all of this rolled out um is you know Carl and I met when I was 11 he was 12 we've been mm -hmm. friends since you know before he played music and and you know uh, all the way through you know most of our lives and and eventually we had played music together I you know showed him enough to get going on bass and he mm -hmm. was smart enough that he could just figure it out on his own he didn't really need anybody's help other than just kind of like here's the basics guy right. okay now let's go and and we um we did actually uh an interesting thing though is that somewhere along the line like we one of our little fanaticisms was to try to really make sure we did not play the same thing at the same time we yeah. weren't we were trying to not just copy the ramones and just go okay G, 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 C, C, D, D, D. you know we were trying not to do that we were trying to like carl would always play something different from what i was playing and so we sort of just learned accidentally some manner of harmonic structure it was completely by accident <laughs> because neither of us are trained but right, sure. you know we we could tell we were smart enough to know that okay like oh that didn't work okay well that sure did work cool let's do that you know so anyway then then we come to descendants you know years later playing together 
And the so, you know, Carl and I already have our own entire musical back and forth, our whole mm-hmm. musical, you know, not language. It's different from everybody else, but we certainly have developed all the communication skills that are common to bands. And so from the perspective, you know, and we were both huge Descendants fans. So the first thing I remember is, is I remember getting into the practice room, getting our stuff set up when I when I've gone out to, to try, try out, if you will. Um, to to play with them for the first time, and I'm like, "What key is is Suburban Home in?" Um, and Bill tells me, and and I go, "Oh, okay." And then, wham, we lay into it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, in a in a three day sort of a tryout, let's jam and see if this works thing, we had covered a lot of ground. We had played a lot of the songs that a lot of the you know the more out there stuff that that you know showed up on um, Descendants All. We had tried like Uranus, for instance. That's a learned, pretty... uh, you know, all this about each other. Uranus, Uranus. We did that first. Uranus, schizophrenia, all in my band. All yep. of that stuff. Iceman Cometh. All of those songs we played in those first three days together. So we we realized very quickly. I, I think from Bill and Milo's perspective, it was like, well, okay, these guys already have musical communication, so that's that's worth. You know, they had already, Carl was already in. You know, when I called to congratulate him, I found out that they needed a guitar player too. So I was like, oh, shit, okay. So that's how right. that all came about. And and I think Bill went, well, this is a pretty obvious fit. This makes pretty good sense. These guys are already friends. They have a good musical communication. They have, you know, interesting music to bring to the party. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it was, but I mean, no question that from my perspective, being both a huge Descendants fan and a huge Black Flag fan, like just getting to play with Bill was just weird for Carl. I mean, yeah. it was just, you know, it's like we were on, we were blown away by all of that. Um, you know, because I think the first day we jammed without Milo. And so it was like, OK, wow. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're playing and, with one of the best. You know, we had seen <laughs> exactly. him play plenty of times. We'd opened for him in our sure. bands. But, you know, it was yeah. it was different uh, to actually, you know, play with that and feel what that was like. And it worked immediately. I mean, it was it was like, you know, very obvious that it would that it would be a good fit. And so what's funny is that little I remember in that first couple of days, mm-hmm. Um, you'll know what I'm talking about here. And so will everybody else that's, that's seen us. Um, Bill was like, Oh, by the way, we don't really like, we don't really count off our songs <laughs> per se. We just kind of dive into them. And yeah. I was like, okay, I've never done that, but okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah, let's try it. Bam, and we plow into the songs and it just works fine. And so it's like that, those kinds of things, like now, you know, here we are, what is it? 36, 37 years. I've, I've been in the band now. Um, or, you know that that this lineup has existed and and those things are so just you know they're normal it, it's mm-hmm. funny you see you wonder you know how how it works for a band like the stones where you got you know jagger and richards and yeah and, and uh watts you know together um at least that core um a thing that is just you know re- absolutely unknown quantity to everybody in it you can you take you could not do it for five years and walk back up and it's just autopilot you know exactly what to do because yeah. you've just invested so much time and learned so much about how each other does their thing and that's still true it's it's uh you know it still fascinates me actually that it that it rings true all of these years later it's it's really not that much different than the first day we played together. <laughs> well, that's amazing because also, I mean, because the Descendants especially are one of those bands that, you know, there's a new generation that kind of finds out about them and connects with it as if it was happening in real time, as if, you know, as if that record came out Absolutely. that year. And that's, but then also you have like maybe their parents as well that also, you know, are like, oh, I love those records too. So let's, let's go see the Descendants play. <laughs> Absolutely. We have literally had a four generations of descendant fan wow. family come to see us before. Holy moly. Yeah. I mean, there were some real, real young ones in there that were real new to it. But sure. They, they, you know, they were interested. So, you know, I, I mean, I've seen it happen. It's amazing. It's amazing when that happens. So, and then, so, so when you think about that, and you, th- and you think about the fact that, like, some of these songs you're playing are you know like like you mentioned it's like muscle memory practically you don't even really like need to think about it so what do you do you have anything you do to kind of find new new ways to like make it um 
make it a challenge or, or interesting? Or are you even thinking about that at all? Like, do you listen to different things about no, it? Are you even thinking at all? I, no, I don't really think about it too much because at, in the moment, so, you know, all the practicing that we, that we did over the years and still do now, all of that practicing is, has more to do with keeping physically able to do it because it is a challenge, even, um, you know, even, even on guitar, I imagine what a challenge it would be for, for, for Bill. Bill. Yeah. But, um, you know, the physicality of it, but the, the, for me, a lot of it has to do with making it so second nature that when I'm playing and I, this is going to sound a little, maybe kind of hippie esoteric, <laughs> uh, it's you okay. know, a, it's a, a little space. bit, but, but I always feel like what's important is to take the songs to the audience i say you know to my friends i say deliver the songs to the people that's what you're here to do you know you you um so i don't really need much out of it because just the act of doing the thing that we do together the way we do it is yeah. plenty of satisfaction for me even you know and you know you'll hear people you know bands complain about you know god i just don't want to play this song or that song anymore i don't have that problem yeah. at all Want to play suburban home? Fuck yeah! You yeah, know, with these guys. Sure, let's play suburban home. Like that's great, and that's totally what it's like for me. Um, for me, I like I like to feel like it's connecting this to the audience that loves that music. Right. You know, that's that's what I love to do. I love to feel that connection to the extent that I can, and and that they can, and you can usually tell that that's happening. There's a, there's a back and forth between a band and an audience in the, in the moment. And so for me, I like it to be pretty second nature. I like it to be, you know, muscle memory. Um, mm -hmm. and physically, I just like to bring myself up to the place where I can do it well enough to, to pull it off still. But, but it, at the end of the day, it is about, connecting to the audience for me and, and and a lot of people would say that that's bullshit you know art is only for you or art is art is you know not meant to be you know directed that way but i that's not how i feel i like i like you know it's like these uh you know i saw elvis costello recently one ah, of my love elvis costello yeah heroes right i mean he's like you know he's pro you know i mean there's kind of like lennon mccartney and costello and you know handful of other people but he's right Pollard, in there with like my <laughs> favorite you know my favorite people yeah and i got to see him pretty recently and it, and you know that it, it it is it's like you're connecting with this song thing happening in the moment you know a song that you know and love and had some meaning to you and 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 you know if you think about it that's why people still give a shit about the bands they give a shit about years later you know years and years down the road you know why would you keep going back to see a band or revisit a record over right. and over again well there's a there's a connection made that is that is uh um it's huge and it and for me it's to be honored you know, so yeah. so that's kind of where I'm at with, with the playing. Like, I don't have any issue getting up there and playing the, the same song, you know, playing clean sheets another time. Fuck, I'm, I'm totally here for it because it's a, you know, at that point, it's more of a vehicle to connect to an audience and a group of people and a, and a moment, an event, you know. Some of which maybe have never heard you play before ever, too. It may Absolutely. be their first time, right? That's... And better still, better still, you know, great. Hey, yeah. you know, then 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 maybe someone's going, whoa, I relate to this whole situation. Yeah. Or you're, you know, you're, um, I remember, you know, when I saw the first time I saw McCartney, or the only time I saw McCartney, um, you know, uh, doing his thing, I, you know, it's probably 10 or 12 years ago, he came through and played in, in, um, in Tulsa. And, uh, you know, I started in eight days a week and I burst into tears. Yeah, yeah, I mean... Amazing. Right. <laughs> um, I saw her standing there still that, slaps, you know, as it turns out. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know, but it's kind of like this is something that that, you know, refers to a DNA level event almost because, yeah. you know, um, it said, uh, you know, Carl was telling me about this book, uh, uh, this book called This Is Your Brain on Music. And, and I got um, that book as a gift and I can't wait to read it. Yeah, I'm, I haven't read it yet, but he was telling me about a piece of it that where where in music kind of you know when you're young when your mind when your mind is still developing and you connect to music it's lar it's partly in your language center it's it's like comfort and knowledge and 
you know, clarity. So, so in a funny way, hearing eight days a week, seeing it happen is, is a, um, you know, it's, it's a weird connection that can only happen that one way. (laughs) So, so the way I see it, you know, uh, yes. Okay. They may be connecting with, uh, you know, I want to be a bear <laughs> instead, but, you know, um, but that doesn't mean that it didn't maybe, connect. Maybe there's a song with don't. farting, but it doesn't mean it isn't any less of a connection. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Absolutely. And so, so, you know, to me, it's, it's more about honoring that connection and making that connection and sure. seeing it through. Yeah. That is more important than, you know, fiddly stuff about the guitar because fiddly stuff about the guitar, I'll do that stuff on my own time, you know, right. or, or bring a song. If I'm like, Hey, here's a song. It has some fiddly shit in it. The band's down. We're all good with that. Um, as proven, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but like, as far as, as far as answering your question in the long winded way that I tend to do <laughs> that, the, uh, that's, that's where, you know, that's kind of where I, I get my center. If you will, I don't have to look for new, for the new in it really well and it's interesting uh, also when did you go wireless when 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 did you when did you do that i you know wireless was brief for me i only did that uh, um i only did that during shit i don't know it's been it's you know but the funny thing is i've been using a cable again for for a while 15 now years, 15 years 14 you know, well the only reason i ask is one time one of the times i saw you 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 would you were wireless i'm like oh interesting and like, and it, I, it, well, I thought I'd ask you because I thought it was interesting. I wanted to get, I thought that I would like to maybe, you know, go out physically into the crowd, but sure, I don't know that that really, I don't know. It, the time, you know, you there could be a lag, you know, it could be really weird. Yeah. It didn't feel right. So I tried it a few times. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm not doing that. Well, I, I, and, and it, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, and it, that's a pretty random uh, switch up for there. But in fact, you know, with the other night, my wife reminded me um, of of how the demise of my of my we used to call it a jet pack, you know, my little yeah. wireless guy was that um, we were playing at I believe it was the Roxy, and Fletcher from Pennywise got up and played a song with us, and he takes my you know I gave him my guitar, he yeah. played Nervous Breakdown, I think it was, and then he hurls my guitar out into the crowd, <laughs> and I'm like. Fuck! You know, so I dive off the stage, run off, and, oh, thanks, and pal. Go, you know, go yank the guitar back out of somebody's hand. And in the process, that thing got destroyed. The little yeah. jetpack guy, oh. and I never bought another one. <laughs> I just never got around it. He even gave me money for it. Uh, you wow. know, he's like, "No, oh, sorry, dude. Here's, you know, I just <laughs> right. I had to in the moment." I was like, "It's fine." You know, uh, we're good friends. And so, um, you know, so he he actually gave me some money. I tried to say, Fletcher, don't bother. He, he's like, dude, I'll set this money on fire if you don't take it. <laughs> So I took it. That's a bro and, right there. Yeah. yeah that very Fletcher. That's that's hundred percent Fletcher. I'd like that. He's, he's good. Um but but uh so you know, that's how it got destroyed and I never replaced it. <laughs> gotcha. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know why that sprung to mind, but I I, I was thinking about the, the, when I saw you and I was like, oh, he went wireless. That's interesting because it seemed it seemed to me like uh, you, you've had you have a very specific guitar sound. I think you use the Black Stars now, if I if I remember correctly, right? Is that correct? I use them most of the. I, I use them a good part of the time, but the Black Star, you know, Black Star is kind of getting its its, you know, it's kind of getting its sea legs or whatever. It's a yeah. smallish company, uh, and. And so, you know, since we don't tend to travel like, uh, you know, we usually fly in and then play a few yeah. days and then fly home. And so for the most part, we're using rental back lines. And so most of the time, a good part of the time, they won't have the Black Star amps. Uh, do you have like a travel head like, or anything that you use or? No, uh, the only thing I travel with is um, is just my two guitars, and uh, I have a couple of I have like a splitter box that I use because I like to run two amplifiers. Yeah. Uh, really, that's partly in case one breaks. Partly, uh, <laughs> partly because the way I was set up for the longest time, I I used one. Um, I used one amp would kind of go to the PA, you know, yeah. that one would be mic'd up or whatever, go to monitors PA. And the other one would be more like a monitor for me. So if I needed to turn up or change something, I could do that and kind of, you know, affect my sound whilst also having a spare. But the, the amp I probably have used the most because black star is dollars available to me is, is the plain old Marshall JCM 900, yeah. which is a, 
not a well-loved amp by a lot of people, but I've figured out how to make it work for me. It's a, it's a little bit of a, of a fight with the, um, the EQ to get it right for me, but, but I, you usually get there. It, it's actually a pretty good amp. Getting back to the, I, I, this, this is not, this is not a gear nerd show, but I am, I am yeah. interested in <laughs> such things. And a pe- but I hear from people one time people love, I hear from fans of the show, for a lot of reasons, but if I get too far into the gear stuff, I really hear from the people that are not into it about how much they don't like it. Uh, sure. So let's talk a bit about, about the records. Like for me, when you uh, when you come in on all, I think there's, for lack of a better term, and realize I say this with peace and love, peace and love, like a proggy element that almost gets brought to it, right? Like you have, sure. like again, you're you're going off of like everything before being like you know the downstroke wonder, and then you have like things like. Uh, you know, van and stuff like that, where you it's like it's getting more academic and more like kind of weird and crazy, almost jazzy to a certain degree. Uh, totally. Did that come kind of naturally? Like just when you guys, when you guys well, were playing? So, so, you know, Carl and I showed up with a lot of those songs. But what was funny, you know, during that three day little tryout period where we where we, uh, you know, Carl was already in, like I said, and, and so I was trying out to. Um during that three-day jam, what I learned was that Bill was also a big fan of a lot of the same proggy music that yeah. I was. He had been exposed to that stuff, I think, largely by Greg Ginn, who was older than him. Greg Ginn's, you know, Greg's about 10 years older than, than us. So, you know, that's where Bill, I think, had come into contact with Mahavishnu Orchestra, King Crimson. Yep. Uh, you know, even, even the Grateful Dead, like, you know, just like music, you know, on a more you know, on, on that kind of a scale, you know, with a, yeah. a little bit more to it under the hood in terms of guitar interest and, and melodic interest, harmonic interest. And so he was 100% there. Bill was, was a hundred percent there for the new odd stuff. And in fact, I think in Carl and I, he was like, Oh, well, these little riffs that I like to experiment with, here's a couple guys who can totally play those. And so, you know, hence a song like Uranus, which he wrote on the guitar, you know, that's all his parts. Yeah. And, Bill writes fantastic guitar parts. He always has. So, so in that way, um, you know, there, there definitely wasn't like too much of a, like, okay, we're going to try to drive the band in this direction. We don't really do that. We've never done that. The way, the way things seem to work in our band most of the time is like, here are the songs we have on deck and we, we learn them, we play them, we pick a bunch that, you know, we pick the, the ones we like best and put them on records and put them out. And, so the stuff that I that I showed up with was, you know, Iceman Kona, uh, yeah. Schizophrenia. You know, that's what I was playing, you know, at the time that I joined the band. And so uh, that's the songs on deck. And so we played them. <laughs> you know, that's kind of what happened. And that's why that record and, and, and a lot of our other ones after it, between All and Descendants, have a, uh, a very sort of all over the place kind of a feel is because, you know, we there was new and different inspiration coming from other places and and you know to again to bill and milo's credit there was never any suggestion that we should try to define the sound by you know the previous members or anything like that it was like hey this is what we're doing now great let's do this are we having fun are we liking what we're what we're hearing great let's move forward and that's that's um that's what we did. Milo was totally down to like, try to write words to my fucked up songs that I was bringing or, you know, um, that kind of thing. So that's really how that played out. The sentence and all, it wasn't a, a deliberate, Hey, let's push the band to Prague. It just was, here's the songs that we got in front of us. <laughs> so here's what we're playing guys. <laughs> well, well, and it's, and I do want to talk about all, because it seems like that was like writ large, especially for all. And I don't want to give that band short shrift, but even not even just like you know uh, you know go, going a little more adventurous with guitar playing, but just like just a song like the Elogistics, right? Of of just like which the first time I heard it, I was like, this is amazing. This is the most amazing song I've ever heard. And then like it 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 works in a way that like this is incredibly silly, but everybody's in on it and it's a good time. And then, like all those little like, yeah. punctuated stabs where everything goes crazy, like it's perfect. It, that, that's a, it's a perfect song for that thing, exactly. Absolutely. I mean, it was you know that was yeah probably you know the some some little hunk of all of us you know being fans of like Monty Python, 
whatever. Yeah, you know yeah I mean? exactly. That's, that's exactly. The, that's the kind of thing you hear in there is the absurdity that, you know, um, and descendants could do that. That was something that was, you know, always there. It could be an incredibly serious song or a, an incredibly absurd one. And yeah, that was always part of it. So, uh, you know, hence you get things like that or, you know, in my band, or just ridiculous shit. Right, know? right. And, and then is so is that immediately at the time is that immediately kind of accepted by people or are they kind of like what are they what are they doing exactly <laughs> like was there a moment well, you know that that record it's funny because if you you know i think i think when that record came out certainly there were a certain amount of people that were just like what you know and then <laughs> what these dudes but, doing? <laughs> i mean if you think about it if, if you think about it, if you take away the like whoa what the hell are they doing on this song and why is this fucking impressions thing on here and all that stuff if you take that part of it away you go well clean sheets that's wicked you know that's great yeah. coolidge great um you know there's there's a, a whole bunch of you know, pep talk, you know, there were, there were, oh, like, they're, they're like there solid were, pop bangers all over that, you know? And, absolutely. Yeah. So it's kind of a, you know, it's a funny record in that way because I mean, you know, we couldn't be dismissed out of hand. as like, Oh, what the fuck happened to these guys? It was kind of a, like, I don't know. I mean, it's cool. It's a little weird, but you know, it's different. <laughs> it's all right. You know? Um, so people were reasonably tolerant of it, but you know, when we would play the stuff, I think people tended to like it pretty well. Like I remember, um, you know, crowds being kind of okay, you know, uh, with, with something like in my van or, or yeah. whatever. And, you know, a, a lot of the time too, I'll say that it, I think it it's fairly common for the really kind of like out there ones with the weird riffs and the, you know, the funny time signatures and all that stuff to end up being silly songs, which disarms the you know the like oh the whole they're thing. trying to get too big for their yeah. places oh, they're it wasn't, so serious you know I, yeah. I think I, that wasn't deliberate it's just kind of how it worked and maybe it's because like what are you going to sing you know are you going to sing a, a a lyric like get the time over music like you know ice man cometh no you're not gonna, you <laughs> it's know? not gonna work I, mean, yeah. I guess you could but certainly we didn't think to do so um <laughs> You know, that that kind of a thing, like, you know, you wouldn't make that stuff together or we it didn't occur to us to do that. Yeah. So those songs just kind of tended to be goofy and therefore people were kind of like, yeah, OK with it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like there was there was sort of a looking back at it, you know, not just as like a kid listening to a cassette tape, cassette tape uh, that uh, like looking as adults, it seemed like it was oh, it was a time of like transition where you guys had this whole sort of world open up to you of, of the kind of songs that you could do uh, to a certain degree. Yeah, and uh, I, think, I think I think in the band we all felt you know I think all four of us felt that we had um, a band capable of expressing a larger vocabulary than right. any of us had ever experienced. I think that's true, and and you know that sort of right on, on descendants all you can really hear that yeah absolutely absolutely and and, and it seemed like there was a um there's a healthy sense of adventure about all of it that has held true and you play a song like all logistics today and everyone loves it because everyone knows it and it's familiar instead of just being like what 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 what's happening exactly right now <laughs> yeah pretty funny yeah so go, Absolutely. so go in, and, and this is, I, I don't want to cover too much of things that you've gone into in depth in, in other media, but I do find it fascinating that ostensibly same guys, right? But when Mil Milo leaves all, you even go deeper in just, we're going to do whatever we want. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to go nuts. We're going to go crazy. We're going <laughs> to do our thing. And it, it's has an audience, but it doesn't, it doesn't hit folks exactly on the same level like there's it's it's kind of again i think the documentary did a pretty good job of showing that you guys were busting ass you're working at, at doing all this stuff and you're putting out great output and it just didn't matter to a certain degree i mean it mattered but it yeah. just didn't matter it it, it did and it, it was just a you know i think i think there was a i i've always felt like there was a certain point when people wanted as they were getting a little bit older the crowd that you know was basically our age group, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're probably looking for bands to be a little bit less scattered, you know. Right. Um, you know, because if you think about, let's say, when Scott was in the band, yeah, you could literally. I, I mean, so during that period, you know, a record like Saves, you know, All Roar Saves would have, you know, 
something like, you know, Prison, which is a, you know, a fairly believable, typical song, you know, and I mean, right next to like, you know, something else that just, you know, educated idiot that was just completely, you know, and so we're bouncing around all over the map and it isn't like we're trying to go, okay, we want this one to stylistically be this, that we don't think of, of records like that. We don't make records like that. We just literally four people with some common influences and some not common influences, just throwing their shit in the pile and just going, okay, we've been writing this stuff all year. Now we're home for the year from touring. Let's learn all, all of each other's songs, practice them, record them and see what we have. And, and literally, you know, you get a record like Percolator that's got fucking, you know, egg timer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's wild. Yeah. It's, what's a, gonna happen. it's a wild and, record. And, uh, you know, then when Chad, you know, and of course, and, and a lot of that has to do with who's in the band at the time, you know, yeah. you know, Dave brought a different, a different thing that we didn't do. Scott brought different yep. kinds of stuff we didn't do. Chad brought different kinds of stuff we didn't do before. So, you know, uh, there was, there was just constant new different information. And that, is, you know, if you look at other bands that sort of don't have a sound, you know, don't have like a thing that they do that is reliable and maybe they kind of, you know, add to it or change it a little bit or, yeah. you know, but they don't just go, Whoa, what the fuck? You know, like for us, <laughs> one record was just all over the map and that's yeah. not for everybody. You know, that's, that's definitely not a way to gain yourself a solid audience. And we just didn't give two shits about that. That didn't make any difference to us because to us, that would, that was a feature, not a bug. Exactly. You know? You're challenging yourself and making art that you love. So what's, what's the problem, right? And that's that's exactly right. It's like if it, if it appeals to us, why wouldn't it appeal to somebody else? And so you put out the record, and and there it is. You know, we're not we weren't trying to be arty or fancy or weird about it. We really weren't. It's just like Scott was going to write dot. I was going to write. You know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. You know, Bill was going to write. I, it's just it, it's just how it was. You know. Well, and it's interesting that you say that because I mean, do you feel like was it more of a mystery like? at the time where you're just like, well, we know the slams. We know that these are good songs. We know that when the crowd shows up to see us, like it's a, it's a good show, but like what's, what's, what's not, what's not clicking? Like what's, are we at, you know, too early, too late? No, no, you know what? I think during those years, we didn't think about that too hard. The main reason is that, is that, you know, we, we were still coming from, I mean, in, in punk rock, there was no ex, there, there was no popularity. There was no expectation right. of anything. You yeah, did yeah, it as yeah. long as you could. You, you, if, as long as you could keep filling the tank, you kept touring. And, you know, that was that was kind of what happened. There was no expectation of anything beyond what we had right there. And we were enjoying that life and living that life. We got to travel to other places to do it. And so for us, you know, we weren't we weren't really. I think thinking about any of that stuff, it just didn't matter to us really. Yeah. Cause you're, um, you're doing it. Yeah, of course you're in it. And we didn't, it's like, this is the, this is success for us. You know, it, by our terms, that was successful to be able to just, you know, manage to keep the thing afloat, tour, do what we loved, play to people, travel. That, that was, uh, that was it. So we didn't, you know, the fact that, that, you know, I mean, you you still want to keep the lights on. I mean, there's, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, we're not, you know, yes, we needed to, to make a living too, but we were fine keeping a pretty small profile. It wasn't like, okay, we got to keep building the thing. Like that wasn't what we were like. And so there, uh, yeah, that's just kind of where, you know, where things were. <laughs> How was anyway. how was Brookfield as a uh, center of operations? Because that's one of my favorite things about all. Is like I was like, oh, they moved to a place basically to make it more easy to tour. You how? know, at the <laughs> at the time, um, uh, at the time, at the time, it was kind of like we were on tour so much it didn't even really it didn't matter. matter. Yeah, he's want to be somewhere cheap where your stuff's going to be when you. Yeah, you it's just it's back. fine. Yeah, we were only home a couple months a year. It didn't matter. Um, hang on one second. Sorry. Uh, oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it didn't seem to to matter much, you know, because we were only there, you know, little bits. And then, uh, yeah, that was kind of how it went. And then eventually we're like, eh, we're kind of sick of being here. There's nothing here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't make the time that you actually are there exactly lovely. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, we weren't really doing anything. There, you know, eventually it was like, okay, well, I think we can, you know, we let let's let's go somewhere else and try something different. So we we packed up and went to Colorado, which was great. Yeah. Um, go for it, and yeah, so. You know, and then and then eventually, you know, built a studio uh, not too long after we got there. And then, and then, you know, I ended up married, you know, uh, starting a family and, you know, pulled up stakes, came down here to Tulsa. So my kids would have, you know, a larger family group to be around. And uh, yeah, and then that's kind of just how things played out. So. Do you find that? As you're, uh, I mean, Tulsa is not exactly a cultural hotbed uh, from from my perspective. Other people like may disagree depending on what their interests are. But do you find that, uh, you know, absorbing yourself in music and having the ability, the, the freedom that, uh, you know, living in some place that has like a lower cost of living than like in New York City or Los Angeles or something. Uh, do, you, do you find that that helps your creative process just to have that? Absolutely. Space? Absolutely. It does for me. Yeah. And and a. Um, a, a bit of life where where I can, you know, more where I'm not like kind of rubbing up against so much kind of rat race stuff, traffic, that yeah. kind of stuff. It's it's a it's a fairly uh, easier, simpler thing that we have here. And I I I think when I was young, I I expected that I wanted to just be in big cities and be in that chaos, be in that energy. I enjoy it, but. Um, I think actually I like this better. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but when I'm out around now, I go, you know, I, I actually don't want to just be in traffic for hours. I'm not as into that as I thought I was. And so, <laughs> so true, yeah. I'm happy. I'm very happy here. You know, it, it's a, it's a very manageable size. It's the kind of thing where I can just pop over to the airport. It's about 15 minutes from here, you know, <laughs> that kind yeah. of stuff. It's not, it, it's, it's, uh, it's offered it's offered us uh you know ease of functionality as a family and so in that way it's kind of worked out great and you know tulsa actually has an incredible music history so in a funny way there's a lot uh there's a lot about it here that you know kind of resonates with me it's funny you know one of the sort of preeminent musicians from here leon russell was somebody who my mother was a huge fan of. So his records were played in my house my entire life. So it's funny coming here and, you know, meeting people who knew him and, you know, seeing his old studios, you know, that kind of stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty rad. There's, there's an incredible musical history here, even though, you know, there's fewer bands that were massive, you know, or whatever, but there were a lot of side men came from here that were, uh, you know, Carl Radel, the great bass player played with God, bazillions of different people. Sure. Yeah. From here. There's, there's a, there's, you know, it's kind of a, there, there's a big, big, vein of musical history here that's really interesting so in that way tulsa has kind of been cool i, well, I, I enjoy it and it's easy for folks that are from you know quote unquote cool areas of the world to sort of just in, just offhandedly dismiss places that they either never oh, heard oh, of or never yeah. been to like oh that's yeah, clearly but, terrible but no it's it, it's actually it's actually pretty cool here yeah i gotta say well and okay. and you know i'm someone that you know I, I grew up in california but i grew up in the central valley mm. I grew up in like modesto which is not a cool oh, place yeah, at all yeah. <laughs> like it's a great yeah not the cool part of california yeah yeah exactly more yeah. in common with kansas than, than uh <laughs> than uh san francisco but right totally I, <laughs> that's funny i think it's fascinating when you have people that kind of pull up stakes for to be in a place like so do, do people like do people know that you play in bands that you know maybe they heard of or is, is that even just a different part a, of your a life? little a little bit but you know it took a while i mean i had a studio here for um for about 10 years and so i recorded a lot of bands here a lot of bands you know some bands would come from other places especially if it was close texas isn't too far you know dallas to here's like four and a half hours or something so sure. so you know we would have bands from other places but but also um uh you know, it, it, it kind of got me to meet, you know, the younger, the younger folks around here. And, and so, um, you know, younger bands and that kind of thing. And, and, um, but you know, it, it's, we're a little bit disconnected because we don't play here very often. Like d funny, I've lived here 20 years. Descendants has only played here once. Oh, during really? that time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Isn't that weird? That like, is weird. You know, yeah. That's pretty funny. But, uh, um, uh, so, you know, that's kind of unusual. Can you tell me a little bit about, I, I would say so. I mean, golden opportunity, really. Uh, 
how did everything sucks come about? Because I really, really like, I really like that. Uh, I really like that. That. Well, everything sucks. You know that the way the way all of that kind of laid out was that we had a, uh, um, you know, we were just kind of doing our thing, our usual thing, and all. And at some point, when you know Milo contacted Bill, and he was like, um, uh, he was he you know he was done with he was finishing up school and he was not quite ready to dive into the you know the job world yet with with his new uh, phd so he wanted to take a year right you know do a record do a do some shows and and that kind of thing and so it just kind of you know that it, it came out of that we did um again you know the the funny thing though is milo had a batch of songs too that he'd written and then you know all of us had our other ones and like usual, our normal, you know, like here's what we have so far. And I actually witnessed a, a phone call between Milo and Chad in which they picked from a large list of songs that oh, nice. we've been working on. Oh, I'll take this one. Th- this one's all one. This and, is a Descendants song. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, same guys. Why not? The all record. Yeah. This one's going to end up on the Descendants record. It actually happened like that. That's wow. really funny. Uh, so, um, and then we, you know, we we went ahead and just practiced the hell out of them, and and uh, and recorded the record. And you know, I'll say that when you're sometimes when you're making a record, some of them are a slog, some of them are some of them you can just tell they're going well. Yeah, it, it, it's yeah, yeah. It, it you know, and, and there's a range of things in there, but you you know, it's nice when you can go. I think this is pretty good. What we've got, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's a good one. Yeah, and that that record, it felt like that. To me, at least at the time, it, it, it was not a, uh, a drag to make. Some records are a drag to make, and it doesn't make them doesn't make them any less interesting as a record in the yeah. long run. But making them, it can be a drag sometimes, like depending on how things go. And that one was not. That one was easy. It was fun. I could tell it was. I was like, yeah, this has got good energy. I like this record. And. And I still feel that way about it. Yeah, I, I can still, you know, hear that and go, yeah, okay. I see why people dug this record. And while it's not, you know, it, it does, it does branch off from like, let's just say, if we were, you know, there, there's, it, it's not a completely just a static sound or something, but it, it is a little bit more together. That, but that was entirely coincidental. You know, <laughs> it just, you know, it's I way. mean, yeah. it's still different. And if you take a song like Caught, that's nothing like. Uh, you know, uh, I, I won't let me let you down or whatever that, you know, those are, those are all, you you know, still, those aren't alike yet. You know, they did fit on the same record, but it wasn't just this weird radical disparity of stuff where people are scratching their heads going, I don't even know what this band is trying to do right here. It it was a little bit more, uh, I think it just sort of fell into place as having a little bit more consistency to it in that way. And people responded to that. Um, but also the times, you know, people, people, um, you know, that was when punk was blowing up on the radio. Yeah. None of us were prepared for this. None of us knew this was good, was coming. So this is all of a sudden Green Day, Offspring, they're all getting big on the radio. And so, you know, as people are discovering punk rock, a young, a young bunch of people coming and going, wow, punk rock. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, like, let's, let's look more into this. And so, you know, they found us in there and kind of went, oh, wow, these guys, okay, okay, these guys are cool. And, and you know, managed to, so, you know, that stuff I was saying earlier about how a band might connect to a young crowd, we had a few different periods where that happened to us. That happened to us in My to College, happened to us in Descendants All with a new, you know, very different sound, a different young group of people that were discovering that sound. And it happens again with Everything Sucks, you know. So it was, yeah. it's kind of like, descendants got you know very lucky in that regard that we had you know a few different periods we were together long enough and just you know the way the the right place the right time whatever you want to call it where it had um you know we connected with a, a new young bunch of people that were that were interested and um you know it remains to be seen whether a record like hypercathium will you know have that same kind of effect but you know it, it, i mean people seem to to catch on to it okay and like it okay and i i i see young people at the shows that are clearly a hell of a lot right, younger right. than the last bunch so <laughs> so um you know so i i think it it must be working a little bit at least and that's awesome 
Well, and it's cool also, uh, and, and I know I want to be mindful of your time, but uh, like I thought the Ninth and Walnut release was cool too. Like it was cool. To hear I those. love it. I love listening to it because, you know, I was around a little bit when they were, for, well, I got to hear them playing some of that stuff yeah. after they hadn't played together in years. And, you know, there are certain things about a band you just can't take out of them. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's yeah, the yeah. very thing is that when you say that you can tell, you know, you hear me playing, you can yeah. tell it's me. Well, you know, the way a band fuses together, the good things, they, you know, the good technical aspects of their playing, the, the things that maybe are a little lacking, all of that together is what a band sounds like. I mean, that's why certain groups of people playing together have such an incredible impact. And so when I heard Frank and Tony and Bill play together, I was like, holy fuck. That sounds like Milo goes to college. And it's like right an there. alternate universe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just like, here we are. These guys haven't seen, they haven't been in the same room in, in the, you know, in the, doing this thing together in decades. And they walk up to their instruments, pick them up, put them on, and it sounds like Milo goes to college. Yeah. Because that's what they were. That's what they do is that that group of people. And it, it, uh, it was fascinating to see that happen and to be part of it. And I love the, I, I loved the, you know, I, I had known about the songs, but I hadn't heard all of them, like, uh, you know, Sailor's Choice. Yeah. I knew the names of all of them. Dylan told me, oh, yeah, well, you know, before Molly Goes College, there were all these other songs. There was, you know, and, and he would tell me all the names of them. It's my hair, you know, or whatever. And I was like, God, that sounds so cool. But there were no recordings of them. So, um, you know, maybe a live tape somewhere exists or something, but, you know, I don't have it. And so it was great to get to actually hear all of that stuff. And so I'm, I'm really stoked. About and, it. and it came out at a time that people just needed something nice too, you know? Yes. <laughs> yes. It was, it was, it, 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 it was lucky that that happened to be ready yeah. to go because it, it needed, you know, um, it, it, it was time for something like that at that time. What a brutal time that was. Uh, a couple more things. I would be disingenuous to not mention the thing in the news assholes get to wear oh, yeah. t-shirts of cool bands too is what i would say about that <laughs> well you know it, that kind of stuff you you know um a few friends of mine texted me and they just said you can't pick your fans now i mean this guy is you know from if, if i understand it right this guy you know was part of that world briefly left it and has moved on yeah great that's good um you know i i uh my wife made the joke, you know, she, she said, you know, even Dee Snyder's got a button down shirt. You know, and <laughs> you're in, like, you're you doing know. testimony. Exactly. I would not wear any that rock and roll I shirt. I was like, dude, man, you just, you just, you know, you just brought up, you know, uh, you just brought up a whole bunch of, yeah, I mean, discussion is discussion. It's fine. I mean, it, it, it's going to happen. And, yeah. uh, you know, certainly we had to, you know, we felt compelled to go, look. Just so, just for clarity's sake. Yeah, for clarity's sake. We're we're not into the Oath Keepers. That's not our thing at all. Our band is quite unified on how we feel about these kinds of uh, these kinds of things. So, you know, we're fortunate. We don't have you know any outliers in it. Our our group is very is very. uh, We we have a lot in common in that regard. Let's put it that way. So we were able to very easily go. We're not into the Oath Keepers. Just so you know, (laughs) right and. You know, and of course, a few people are going to respond badly to that. And okay, okay that happens. It, it, so it, I just, you know, at this point, it's it. already that shit's already in my rearview mirror. I'm just letting that thing move along. Yeah, yeah, and and that's <laughs> I think that's the appropriate. And I, I actually personally appreciated you guys very speedy response, faster than some politicians, I might add, when they get in. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. We wanted you guys it were just clear, boom. Defined. No, not just us. Like, here, just so, just, you know, I don't, you know, where this guy stands and, you know, what he's, you know, he's, uh, I know he's probably testifying against them as much as anything. Fine. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever is happening. Whatever it is. Just so nobody out there has any confusion. This is where we're at. Not our bag, so, baby. Not our bag. Yeah, that's where we're at. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's completely disingenuous for me to try to ask you to do this, but Flag, can you give me like the Reader's Digest version? Because I think that's so amazing, and I, I love that it happened. Well, the, the quick, the quick and easy story on that one uh, is that that Golden Voice, the uh, long running, um, well, at that point, thirty years running uh, promotion company that did bazillions of punk rock concerts in Southern California and beyond. Um, was doing their 30th anniversary shows and they had three nights booked at the Santa Monica Civic and they had approached Chuck Dukowski saying, hey, would is there any chance Black Flag would, would play? And he was like, not a chance. But Keith and I have, the, Keith and him had played fairly recently 
uh, together, um, just jamming a few songs with some friends and that kind of thing. And so, you know, Bill and them, of course, you know, obviously Bill's part of it. And Bill's been friends with Keith since he was a little kid. So, so it was like, well, we could get, you know, Bill and Stefan maybe to do it. And so we got up and we played the Nervous Breakdown EP. Um, nice. And the place went absolutely yeah, probably mad. was probably was okay. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a, we had a great time. It was so much fun, and for me, it was huge because this is another chance for me to you know to play with some people who are just massively important to me. Yeah. So then we, uh, you know, then of course a few people came sniffing around. Hey, any chance of other shows? And we were like, well, I don't know. Yeah, probably. And so we thought, fine, let's do some shows. And we'll, we'll ask Dezo to join up, and uh, you know that would broaden the thing, make it even kind of more cool, more fun because everybody loves Dezo, and so. Uh, you know, we, we did a bunch of shows and, you know, in 20, 2013, 2016, and then, um, you know, it's not out of the question. We'll do a couple more. I don't know. Uh, there, you know, certainly we're all pals, but Keith's really busy. You know, we're doing our thing. He sure is. Keith (laughs) buried right now for the moment. So, um, so there's no immediate plans, but there's no plans to not do any. And there, there are a few places that we didn't get around to that I wouldn't mind seeing us go to if, uh, just to do it because it's a really a lot of fun and for me again this is another huge place where like connecting the songs to the people and yeah the, the time all of that stuff it's huge for me and it's huge for me to you know obviously you can't step into those shoes and you know into greg's shoes and really expect to pull it off exactly but you know i don't know that anybody else is going to have studied it any harder than i have <laughs> over the years so at least i can go up there and you know kind of try to make a showing of it and it's certainly a blast and certainly the energy level is there that's I mean, what we want out of it. And, and, and it's it's a blast and it seems like just from the video that that i had seen because i wasn't lucky enough to be able to see it is that like it was not done like cover band style it was it was done like no. you know, intense it was intense no that's exactly right from from uh from from the word go it was about you know it was really about making sure that we delivered it at you know at least at the at the kind of energy level and the meaning that it yep. had at the time and you know i had been lucky enough to see them you know within in a few different iterations and so it it was it was uh you know it was huge for me to get to do fucking awesome Seven, <laughs> this is this has been fantastic. Last thing, it's the only can question I ever ask. You can choose interpret it however you like. Thank you so much for spending so much time for me. But can question, why do you do what you do? I am compelled to. I, I really don't have any other thing to to offer. Uh, and it's just it is my life's it is just my life's pleasure and my life's work and everything else. I absolutely love it. Thank you so much, sir. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, we'll do this again sometime. Yeah, yeah. Thanks thanks for suffering through. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Sorry we had some tech issues in the beginning there. It happens. It happens. Uh, have have a lovely sure. evening. Take care. All right. Good luck to you. Thank you. Oh, there he goes. Stephen Edgerton. Hey, that was that was nice. That was nice. I hope you guys liked that. That, that's a, the, that made me very happy. And I think that was... Uh, that was a good time. <laughs> so, yeah, let's uh, let let's hear a song or two, and um, close it out. Thanks for everyone uh, sticking with it. I think that uh, you know it, it can be a lot. Oh yeah, I got, I, I, I reference it. We got to do this one. Here we go. Oh, worshippers of the mighty, all. I had a dream. The bass master general came to me. We had a little snack in a donut shop. He said, drink of my bonus cup, it is my blood. Eat of this crapper, it is my body. And his spirit entered me and I became allular. The bass master said, you are the chosen one. These are the allogistics. Thou shalt not commit laundry. Thou shalt covet thy neighbor's food. Thou shalt not create ties with the skated. No. Thou shalt always go for greatness. Thou shalt not commit adulthood. Thou shalt not partake of decaf. Thou shalt not suppress relaxation. Thou shalt not commit hygiene. Oh! 
Thou shalt not have no idea. Oh. Thou shalt commit thyself to an institution. No. Oh. Thou shalt not take the band's name in vain. Thou shalt not allow anything to deter you in your quest for all. All! Oh. Tell me, good people, who is the fellow team or crowd of Gas. Let him also bear forth his ass and cast forth the first rap. Oh! You may achieve base by chanting the small psalm of all. Oh! Chant with me. Quah, 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 quah. Chant. Quah, 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 quah. Pretty good, pretty good. Quah, quah. So, there you go. That was Suburban Home. Before that, The All Logistics. Stephen Edgerton is this in the name? house. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, we had some problems earlier on. I'm not shy about saying that. But uh, we got through it. Uh, he's a mensch, that fella. Nice nice dude. And, uh, yeah, hell of a player. And I, I really enjoyed that. So, there you go. There you go. Go find him on the internet where we all live. Stephen Edgerton on uh, Instagram. It's probably the best place to do it. Descendants. This thing on. They do stuff. Perhaps you heard of them. <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, that dude made Tulsa better, I think. <laughs> Actually, I know that. Name of the show is Code New Transport Tonic Reversal. Thank you very much for listening to it. This show airs Thursdays, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific, on RadioNook.com. Streaming on YouTube and Switch, usually. ProtonicReversal.com for the archives. Always free, no ads, no sponsors, no kidding. But if you like the show and want to get episodes sooner, signing off. Patreon.com slash ProtonicReversal will... Achieve that goal. 
Thanks, folks, for uh, you know, sharing the show around, liking, subscribing, playing it through to the end. I make that hard, don't I? I've got that helps people find the show, and uh, I don't take that lightly. Fifty thousand watts of power. I think that uh, there's some good stuff coming up, and I thank all of you for sticking with it. Ionize the air. Leaving reviews, sharing the episodes around, uh, I appreciate it. And thanks. This microphone turns sound into electricity. I think we're going to send us some stickers. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Out on Stay safe out there. Dark and lonely. And take it easy. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the, it's the end of radio. The last announcer plays the last record. The last what? Leaves the transmitter. Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now? Broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day.